All right, what's going on, guys? So today we're going to be talking about the Poincaré group. The Poincaré group is something that you've come across on YouTube, probably, if you're into physics. And I find it, I find the ways that it's presented in physics to be quite uh, not very easy to understand. So I made, I'm making this video to help us understand a little bit more about what the Poincaré group is especially within sort of a more mathematical context. And uh, we're going to understand also what it is within the context of physics as well. This is, uh, I think, going to be a relatively short video, but uh, I think I hope it's going to be illuminating for all of you. Again, if you like this kind of content, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. And you can go onto my Patreon page where, you'll, where you will find early content as well. So with that being said, make sure, uh, let's get into the material. All right, so we're talking about the Poincaré group. Poincaré group. So before we talk about this, let's talk, let's step back a few steps and let's really think about something here. The thing that we want to think about, we want to, we want to think about when we rotate mathematically, what we've done in quite a few videos is we've said, if we exponentiate something, say something that looks like this, we can exponentiate a matrix, but in that exponentiation, inside when we do this we need this parameter theta say this parameter theta is the parameter that we use to uh that, that we use to define how much of a rotation we are undergoing and so when we do something like this we find out that this parameter shows up in the argument of these of of these um, cosine and sine uh, functions, these ten, these uh, trigon trigonometric functions. So, in some sense, the the parameter that you exponentiate is the argument inside the trigonometric functions that tells you how much to um, how much of an angle to rotate, say within some plane or within some uh, some space. How, okay, so what if we're talking about three-dimensional space, though? You can, in, in one dimension, you can rotate, and in the other dimension, you can rotate, uh, but in the other dimension, you can rotate, and you can do this for as many dimensions as you want. So you need to be able to find a way to encapsulate all of this into, say, one variable, which would be very nice to do. And so the way we do that is we say... Um, we can think of this as a matrix. I don't actually want to really think about it as a matrix. So let's um, let's scratch this. We can all, so theta can be um, defined. Can also be defined. I don't want to really think about this as a matrix. Let's think about it like this. It can be defined such that theta i is equal to this. So we've seen this sort of formula before, right? We've seen this when we were defining our generators and we were sort of collapsing every, all of our generators. We had what, we had six generators and we collapsed them into uh, generators that had um, uh, th those M generators, right? And so those M generators, uh, the, the formula that we used to do that collapsing uh, looked like this. And we're doing the same thing for this argument here. And this means that we have three values of theta, essentially, right? because uh, theta one is looks like this. We use the formula here, but it can also be this, right? Because we can swap, uh, we can do two three or three two in this in this Levi Civita symbol, and we can do the same here, and we can do the same here. And what we find out is that. Theta one can be this, or it can be this. It can be this, or theta two can be this or this. And theta three can be this or this. Right. So what we got going on here is what a W matrix or an omega matrix that's anti-symmetric, right? Because two three is opposite of three two. Uh, one three is opposite of three one, and one two is opposite of two three. Okay. So each, so what, how can we sort of conceptualize this? How can we understand 
this well as i've mentioned before each angle we can think of as corresponding to rotating is the parameter that's going to be doing the rotating in some dimensional space so in our four dimensions right usually what when we say four dimensions we're talking about space time the spatial dimensions and the temporal dimension however i can't draw four dimensions um so i just draw three right so but i put quotes around the 40 right uh, so we have one, two, three, and and when we're doing four, we include a zero into into the mix here, which complicates a little thing, a, a few things. But nevertheless, we can define uh, we can define the number of uh, theta variables in this way, right? We so we we get some we get some way to encapsulate all the theta variables into one equation, and when we do that. Depending on what this equation again looks like, uh, how many uh, how many entries uh, there are, that'll tell us how many theta var variables there are. In a two D representation, we might only have uh, theta one and theta two, right? So theta one is going to rotate us around, say, um, in one one plane. Theta two is going to rotate us around. Uh, or not plane at one axis, theta 2 is going to rotate us around another axis. Okay, so that's how we want to think about these guys right here, right? So we're, we're x, so the, this is the matrix that's going to produce what looks like the rotation matrix, and then this is the argument that's going to be inside of the arguments in that matrix. Okay. So with that being said now, let's take a look here at the what the total Lorentz transformation is based off of the content that we talked about in the last video. We had an infinite dimensional representation and a finite dimensional representation. The finite dimensional representation were all the all the boosts and all the rotations that we were talking about. Right? We we can talk about boosts and rotations in 4D space or we could talk about boosts and rotations in 2D space. Um, and those corresponded to the dimensional representation that we were that we were thinking about, right? So, for example, the one half zero representation had um, the the boosts and rotations. Again, those were in the form of Halley matrices, and depending on if it was a one half zero or zero one or zero one half representation that would change the argument in the exponentiation of the boost. But nevertheless, those were all finite representations, right? We talked those were matrices. You are the argument that you put in is going to be a finite number. Okay. And then we had our infinite dimensional representations as well. In the infinite dimensional representations, again, you don't put a uh, a theta value into those. You have to put something else into those. We're not totally sure exactly what yet, but the idea here is that, again, we have a finite dimensional representation and an infinite dimensional representation. The argument, we have to put this extra argument in there to tell us how much to rotate by. Okay, this one is a little bit weird because um, uh, because when we, so our infinite dimensional representation, remember, mu nu uh, that was x mu d uh, nu minus x nu d mu and then we had an i up front here so we're kind of exponentiating this thing which is a little bit weird to think about which makes this guy a little bit weird to think about as well. We're not going to put too much stock into thinking about it right now, but we just we, we need to say that we have we need we need the oper we need the operator and we need the argument that we put into the operator. Okay. And so we can encapsulate all of this. We can uh, concatenate all of this into something that looks like this. Oh, and actually, we have this a and b here also, right? So the a and b. Uh, refers to so if I have theta a, this is our field at some uh, some value in our space time. This a, then we have b here. 
a field again at some value in our in our space time. These this A and B, well, this is going to have to match, right? So B and B here, these two guys, um, because this guy's a matrix, right? This whole thing is going to be a rotation matrix. And then these two guys are going to help us define uh, the, um, uh, the location in that matrix set or the element in that matrix that, we, that we're interested in. All right, and so that's going to, they have to match again with the arguments, or with the subscripts and the superscripts, with these guys. Okay. And so this, we concatenate this all into this, where this M doesn't have a finite or infinite in it anymore. I've copied this up here, where M with no superscript is defined as these two guys, it's a summation of these two guys, right? Because when we look here, this is just, um, the summation of two exponentials. So we can, we're missing a few negatives in here, but that's sort of beside the point. We want to just keep in mind um, what we can do actually. So, so the negative is actually right here, right? So the negative is going to distribute to these two guys. So anyways, this is it, right? So this is a matrix. These two guys define the elements in that matrix. These two guys are the configurations of the field, and this is the transformation of the field. That's essentially what's going on here. Okay, we found out that M, that these guys formed a Lorentz transform, uh, Lorentz algebra. And we found that that was these guys right here. And keeping in mind that these are all of our boosts and our transformations again, and we also have our infinite dimensional representation. Okay. Here's where the Poincaré algebra comes into play. So we said that this guy right here was a Lorentz algebra. What about a, what about a, uh, a Lorentz algebra and it consisted of a Lorentz group, right? So what about Poincaré algebra or Poincaré group? Well, that's a completely different thing. Well, it's not completely different because we'll see here that we now introduce an operator, or so this PI operator which is i times di, uh, which cons constructs a whole new algebra if we include this in with the Lorentz algebra. The idea here is that this pi is, shows up in an exponentiation. It's an operator. Right? So if we want to shift the field, well, we exponentiate uh, pi, here's again our argument that we've defined, our th sort of our theta argument, and this is going to help us transform uh, the field, right? Because again, the argument here is the argument you have to place inside uh, right here. That's what we said up here, right? We, we said that the theta argument, the theta argument, again, we're placing inside all these arguments, this tells us how much we want to, we, we want to actually move by. This A here is doing the same thing. It's telling us how much we want to shift. Okay. And so this operator here, if we include this in with our Lorentz algebra, what we get, what we, what we get right here is something that looks like this. Okay. Now let's take a look at this really quick. So I've copied it here. And we're just going to go through two examples. So first example is M12 uh, with P3, with our P3 operator. So what is this? So we, using this, we get this. We find out that these two guys are off diagonal. So the Minkowski metric, and so both go to zero. So that's quite interesting. OK, how about our second example? Well, in our second example, we have M12 and M and P2, okay? So what does this, what does this mean? This means, okay, so we have this guy right here, which is actually an on-diagonal. This is an off-diagonal. So if this is an on-diagonal, well, that's minus 1, again, Minkowski metric. 
So we have this minus i times minus 1. Well, that is going to be positive i, actually, right? Because we're not have, we don't have an i times i. Oops. So I need to erase that really quick. i p 1. I'll actually write these to be 1s. My 1s are not great. I, they're just lines. So hopefully you don't confuse them for like L's or anything like that. But anyways, so we have now this relationship. Right here. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. But we never actually, what doesn't really change, however, is that we, we never really touched these guys, this Lorenz algebra. Again, these, these guys are the generators. These are generators. And these guys right here, this is the same algebra. So the, the algebra didn't change. What happened is what we just kind of introduced a new, we could just kind of introduced a new operator. We didn't really change much. And by introducing this new operator, we have we've defined essentially what's a Poincaré algebra. The Poincaré algebra is this commutation relationship along with this commutation relationship right here. And you can see there's some similarities, right? This, some similarities. Uh, uh, mu rho, mu rho, uh, nu rho, nu rho. Right. So these two elements in here. Then we have these two guys here that are a di that are different, and we can see here also. So this p and this p, these are the two new operators. So the Poincaré algebra is really essentially just the addition of a new operator into our Lorentz algebra. It what essentially what it does is it doesn't really change the Lorentz structure or the it doesn't really change anything with respect to our boosts or rotations. It's just introducing a new operator into the into the system here. Um, and so that new operator uh, encapsulates these M's. I right? see so the it encapsulates or doesn't the operator doesn't encap encapsulate the M's. The operator is just something that we can uh, again, form an algebra with these generators. And um, infinite dimensional or not inf infinite dimensional. And we get this new algebra. And that this along with this is the Poincaré algebra. That's why I have this as a bigger box. And the again, a major point here that we want to keep in mind is that the Poincaré algebra renders the um, the Minkowski metric invariant. Okay. Again, because we're just shifting, we're, we're just shifting. We go back here for a second. We, we're just shifting our field. So shifting the field shouldn't change the metric. So the Poincaré, this new operator, again renders the metric invariant. It just make it expands the definition of the algebra a little bit, and so, and it's an infinite it's infinite dimensional, right? Because this is an operator; it's not a matrix. And what we get is this, right? So with this this Lorentz algebra, and the Poincaré algebra is all of it in sort of one one thing. Poincaré algebra is going to be really really important. Uh, especially when we talk about like conformal field theories, and it is sort of necessary to understand. Or when you go when you go through uh, conformal field theories, um, the, learning the Poincaré algebra is usually the first thing you learn. Um, and so this is gonna we we set up the we've set up the backbone for all of what's to come. We're gonna be talking about making the Lorentz algebra. Um, we're we're going to be talking about putting these generators within the context of Lagrangians, essentially. So with all of this being said, uh, I hope you guys like this kind of content. I'll see you guys. Uh, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you guys in the next video.